Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. It's uh, good to see you all here in the sanctuary, and it's good to see all of you who are worshiping at home this morning. And uh, lest, just in case you didn't know it, we can see you at home. No, I'm just kidding. We can't see you at home. But we're glad that you're worshiping with us wherever you are on Facebook or YouTube or however you are worshiping with us. It is Sunday morning here on the 29th day of October, and it is the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. And uh, today we begin our uh, stewardship emphasis for uh, 2023 as we begin to think about finishing this year and moving into 2024. And uh, the theme of our campaign is uh, only two words this year. It is found faithful. And you're going to hear about that for the next few weeks as we talk a little bit about what it means to be found faithful and to be stewards. And uh, some of our lay people are going to get involved and help us do that as well. So that kind of kicks off today and will be going on for the next four weeks. Today we're going to hear from Luke 16. We're going to hear the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's a great story and uh, you're going to hear that in just a few minutes. During this worship service today we'll have some great special music for you and uh, the choir's got a wonderful anthem. We've got a special children's time playing for our young people and uh, as I said we're going to get to hear from uh, some of our lay leaders today and uh, throughout the course of the next few weeks. When it comes time for prayer this morning we will be uh, continuing to pray for the family of Anne. Uh, Anne was a member of this congregation for a long time, Anne and her husband Clyde. And uh, Anne passed away earlier in the week. We celebrated her life yesterday. We're going to be play, praying for uh, Clyde and his family. We're going to continue to pray for Dan and for uh, my friend Nancy, both of whom are healing. And uh, that is good news. We're going to be uh, lifting up Harriet and Helen and Steve. Harriet is Helen's mother. Uh, Helen's brother Bill went home to be with Jesus earlier in the week. And so uh, we're going to think about them and their family as they move through this, uh, this time of grief and uh, get ready to say goodbye to Bill. Uh, we've also been asked to pray for a young woman named Lisa who has uh, been diagnosed with cancer and uh, we'll lift her up in prayer. Are there other prayer requests this morning that you would like to add to our list? Judy. Ray. Ray. And that's a, heal, a prayer for healing for Ray. Thank you very much. G. Pardon me? It's Gray. Gray? G R A. G R A. Thank you very much. Okay, we will pray for. Yes. First name is? Okay. We will pray for Arnie as a healing takes place after surgery. Yes. Bonnie. For healing, okay, that's a prayer for healing for Bonnie. Those of you in the sanctuary know that I repeat these after you give them to me so that the people at home can hear who it is we're praying for and they can be joining us in our prayer requests. Yes, Dan. Uh, prayers for my, my mother in law, Betty, who's recovering from brain surgery. Okay, Betty is healing up after brain surgery. We'll keep Betty in prayer for healing as well. Sandy. Okay. Patty is going to be starting cancer treatments. We will keep Patty on our list for prayers. Yes, Betty. Tyreek. Oh, Tyreek. Yep. Tyreek and his unit. Thank you. Thank you for your, I, yeah, I, I didn't turn around yet, but I was going to, but you, you beat me to it. Thank you for that. Let me go back here first. Yes, Linda. Marsha and Jeanette, both for healing. Thank you. I saw a hand over here. Yes. Lori is going through cancer treatment. We will pray for Lori's healing. Thank you. Others. Yes. This is something good. We we would love good thank you prayers. Yes. Dave retires on Halloween. Is that a trick or a treat? There you go. 
a masquerade party with candy for your retirement. It's a trick that you're retiring. It'll be a treat for your wife that you're home all day. See the way I got that all worked in together? Wasn't that good? Yes, Susan. Stephen and Michelle? Keith and Michelle, thank you, yes. We'll continue to pray for Keith and Michelle, asking for God's healing there. Yes, Jane. Dave and Mary Pat. Dave. He's just put on a ventilator. Okay. Not doing anything. And Mary Pat, okay. Very good. Dave and Mary Pat we put on our list as well. Are we ready to begin worship? I have some great, oh, somebody's pointing. Carl. <laughs> Struggling in Gaza. For the people struggling in Gaza. Very good. Thank you. I have some uh, some words that I want to share with you. Oh, another one. Yes. Okay. People of Maine, the victims of that mass shooting. We will pray for them as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Here's some words from Psalm 90 I want you to consider this morning. This is Psalm 90, verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us. The work of our hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. As we think about those words, let's listen to this morning's gathering music as we move into worship. Will you join your heart with mine in a word of prayer? God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the chance to be here in your house. We thank you for your words that we know will come to us from the, the words of the songs that we sing, from the words of Scripture, from the words of those seated around us. God, let our hearts be open as you speak to your people, for we are ready now to worship. Amen. This morning our opening hymn comes to us from the hymnal. We are going to be singing, O God, our help in ages past, kind of fitting on this 
day that is also a Reformation Sunday in, uh, in some churches. Let's stand and sing the first two verses of O oh God Our Help in Ages Past. I want to invite you to join me as we profess our faith, and the words will be on the screens in the front of the sanctuary. Let's profess our faith together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Before you're seated, I want to invite you to turn around and say hello to somebody this morning and let them know how glad you are to see them. We are glad that you are all here for worship this morning, and uh, we want to offer you now an offering from our choir as they have prepared this morning's anthem.
right, young people, come on down. We have a special treat for you today. Come right on up here. Come along, come along, young people. How are we all this morning? You can, here, just, we can put another backside on there. Here, just squeeze together. There you go. Look, it works. See? That's called sharing. I want to welcome you this morning, and I want to introduce you to my friend, Mr. Mike. And uh, he has a prop back here, Mr. Gary. And uh, during October, in October, it is National Fire Prevention Month, right? Yes. And Mr. Mike and Mr. Gary are firefighters. That makes them heroes in our community, right? And they are going to talk to us a little bit about fire safety because I think it's a good lesson that we should learn as well. So Mr. Mike and Mr. Gary. Thank you so much. We appreciate that big time. Hey, you're going to be watching Firefighter Gary over here putting on his gear. One of the biggest, most important parts we'd like you to understand today is that you see us as everyday normal looking folks, but as we put the gear on, we could get pretty scary looking. And if you ever are stuck in a situation that you need to listen to or watch for these kind of guys, this is what they're gonna look like when they come in. See how important it is that he puts on this gear because what you're supposed to be doing is getting out of a potential fire. His job is to go inside. So he needs to be protected from all of that heat and all that other issues that's going to happen there. Things could fall down on him. It could be pretty nasty inside. So while you're getting out, he's going in. So all this gear that he has, believe it or not, this will withstand temperatures greater than what your stove does at home. Those temperatures at, at your home stove can be, maybe get up to 800 degrees. He could be good for over 1,000 degrees in this. And a house fire, it can go pretty quick. It used to be years ago. It would take uh, probably about 40 minutes for a room to totally evolve into a fire, evolve into a fire. Nowadays, it can happen in less than five minutes because of the material that, the, that is made up in the carpeting and in the furniture and so on. So this gear that he's putting on is so important. So when you see this in, coming into the house or you hear his voice sometimes asking, he's going to be hollering out in there, fire department, call out. He wants you to answer back to him, hey, hey, we're over here, we're over here, if you happen to be in the house. So if you're in your house, here's a good trick to learn. If you're stuck in your room and you can't get out, all you've got to do is open your window a little bit, throw a little towel or a, sh a, a, a blanket out the window. Don't throw it out the window, but throw it through the window. Close the window. The fire department always comes and does what we call a 360. We go around the house and we look for those things. <gasps> There's somebody in that room. We're going to put a ladder up there or we're going to go in the house and go to that room first. The firefighter's job, we put all this gear on. It's very hot and, and it can be a lot of, pretty heavy too, especially in the summer months. But his job isn't to put the fire out. His first job is to make sure you're all safe. Don't hide under the beds. Don't hide in the closet sit on a wall and wait for the fire department to come in. Because parents, it's good to know that your door, if it's closed, the bedroom door should be closed, the fire will stay out for over an hour. The fire departments in this local area will respond in less than eight minutes to your house. That's a nice gap. People can be safe there. So don't worry about what's happening inside as long as if you have to be stuck in your room, stay there and sit on the floor. Don't be standing up and don't be sitting under the window because Gary's going to come in with this big tool and he's going to crash the window if he has to, to get in. We have tools that we can do this. But with all the gear that he has, has on here, he still has the ability to find you and to take you out and make sure you're safe. The other thing we got to make sure you all do, and I, you, kids are going to love this, because today when you leave, when you go upstairs, you're going to be getting a packet. And in your packet, you're going to have this piece of paper in here. And guess what? It's not homework for you. It's homework for your parents. Yeah. Parents' homework. This is how you create an escape plan, how to get out of your house and go to your meeting place. It is so important because when Gary shows up or I show up, we're going to be asking the people at your meeting place, is everybody out? Because if you're not, we're going into search. If you don't know, we're going into search. We're going to make sure because, as I said before, 
Your safety is the most important thing for all of us. Have a great day. Hope you never have to need this. But please, 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 practice. Practice, practice. Fighter Fire Gary, thank you so much. And there they go, off the kids club. Nice job, gentlemen. We, uh, we want to make sure that the kids are safe. And as Mike said, uh, that falls to us, the parents. You know, we got to have an escape plan. We have to talk about fire safety with our kids in our own homes. And uh, it doesn't have to be a scary discussion, but it can be a discussion about being prepared. You know, I was a Boy Scout. The motto was be prepared. Same is true in this instance. Be prepared in case of fire. And Mike or Gary will be glad to give you more information. Back table when you leave. There's a bunch of these out there. On the back up. table, you grab them. All right. We're going to listen to the reading of uh, today's scripture reading. And before Carl starts reading, um, today is October 29th, 2023. Do you know what happened on October 29th? 1938, 85 years ago today, 85 years ago today, Carl Blanchard entered the world. <laughs> Young man, we are ready to listen to this morning's scripture readings. That reminds me at uh, breakfast, some of the guys will say, well, you know, you've uh, retired from teaching and so on. And I would answer that with, well, I'd go back in 10 minutes. Well, what grade would you work with? I said, well, my favorite would be ninth graders. And then right along with that would be track and cross country. But in any event, uh, the scriptures this morning, we have two of them. And the first one is Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, just verses 1 and 2. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. And the second one is a little longer, and that uh, comes from Luke, uh, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And uh, this is the New International Version. The rich man in Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every single day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat whatever fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. That's how bad it was. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So naturally he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus only received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warm them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, 
if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. We give thanks for this, these blessings and this scripture, his word. Amen. We're going to remain comfortably seated and sing two verses of that great hymn, Lord, Speak to Me. Will you join your heart with mine in a word of prayer? Oh God, I pray this morning that you'll use the words of my lips, that you'll use the thoughts of our hearts, that you'll use every part of us so that we might become closer to Jesus. Amen. Friends, I want to pray this morning for grace and peace, that they would be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. And I also pray that I and all of us may be, as that scripture said, found faithful. That is, you know, the theme of our stewardship emphasis this year, found faithful. And that theme is based on the verse that we heard Carl read from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Think of us this way as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Now, I think the us in that verse that Paul refers to are evangelists. People like Paul and Apollos, Timothy, Barnabas, those individuals had dedicated their very lives to bringing the message of Christ to communities all throughout the Mediterranean basin. They had been entrusted with the message of Christ's saving works and abundant grace and life. They feel called, impelled even, to share the good news of the world. But as one of those evangelists, I think Paul recognizes very well that God has entrusted that message of salvation to him. And he sees that not only as an obligation, but as an incredible privilege. That God should believe in somebody enough to entrust the message of salvation with them is just amazing. But you know, the message is not Paul's message. Paul doesn't possess it. Paul calls himself a servant and a steward. And both of those roles, I think, signify to somebody else that somebody else is the owner of the possession. You see, a steward, we know, is just momentarily given oversight for its welfare of an object for a while. And Paul hopes that he might be found by God to be faithful to that sacred calling. In our time and in our place, I think we have that similar kind of hope. We hope that we might be found faithful with all that's been entrusted to us. You know, it has, I think, been rightly said that stewardship is everything that follows after you say, I believe. And that is so true. 
You see, friends, our connection to God comes through the lens with which we view our lives. Our eyes were created with a lens, and the light in front of us has to pass through that lens. The lens then reflects, reflects and interprets that light and shines it into the field of our retina. You can thank me for the biology lesson later on. The eye lens then becomes the medium through which all of our visual sensory of the world can be perceived. And exactly the same is true of our faith. It is the great lens through which we interpret that great big world out there and all that's in it. We see and we understand the world and ourselves and all the people and all the creatures in it, but it has to be filtered through and refracted by our faith in God. Everything that shines in goes through that lens of faith. And when it comes out, what comes out of it is our understanding of our neighbors, our purpose, our actions. It all comes to us through the gift of our faith. Faith allows us to make sense of our lives. It clarifies our purpose. It magnifies our potential. It colors our world with joy and the sense of abundance of God's goodness. You know, the gift of faith and resulting stewardship, I think, come to us first at our baptism. There, many of us receive a baptismal candle, and we give baptismal candles when children or adults are baptized here in our sanctuary. And as that candle is handed over to us, we hear words that sound like this, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You see, friends, in baptism, we didn't just accept God. God accepted us. God chose us at our baptism. And that candle tells us just how much it is that God believes in us. Our lives can reflect the light of Christ into the lives of others. Through all that we say, through all of our actions and all of our words, we reflect the goodness of God, the mercy of Christ, the justice of the divine truth, the hope of the Spirit. The baptismal candle calls each of us to be found faithful. It encourages us to keep looking through that lens of faith so that we can figure out exactly what we can do with all that we have been given. Pastor Rick Warren, who's made the news recently, he founded Saddleback Church in Arizona and grew it to more than 100,000 members of the church before he retired, said these words at a meeting not too long ago. God's plan is not a map for your life that you can unfold and see all at once. It is a scroll that you open a little at a time, but requires your faith. As we journey forward in faith, our life story is slowly revealed. Day by day, that's all. No more than that, we see the situations that we're placed in, the possibilities for us to make a difference, to spread God's light into the world around us. May we be found faithful. And then we get that story today from Jesus. It's a tragedy, really. It's about a person who failed, I think, to recognize his potential. He loses the ability to see himself as a steward of God, and instead he sees himself as a master, the master of all that he possessed. And friends, he possessed a lot. Jesus never gives him a name in this parable. But over the years, theologians have dubbed him as Divis. 
Now that name just sounds rich, doesn't it? Sounds like some purpley aristocrat who lives pretty high on the hog. And outside of Divis's house, just outside the gate, is a poor man, pitifully poor. And in Jesus' story, Jesus does give him a name. He may be poor and he may be insignificant by the standards of the rich man, but, but Jesus gives him the name Lazarus. And we find out that even the rich guy knew his name. Day after day, you see, the rich man would pass by this poor, wretched soul. He passed by and he did nothing to help him, even after knowing his name. And eventually, as will happen, both men die. Lazarus, the poor man, goes to heaven and lies in the bosom of Abraham. Divis, well, he ends up somewhere else. It's a little warm there, and he lives in misery. He gazes far off, and there in the distance, he sees this familiar face. It's Lazarus, and Abraham is there too. But you know, even in the agony of Hades, Divis fails to see clearly. He looks at Lazarus and he doesn't see a brother. He doesn't see a son of Abraham. He sees somebody who is still beneath him. And he wants Lazarus to come and serve him. Why, Lazarus, just go. Fetch me some cool water, will you? Surely, after all, Lazarus is there to serve him, right? The story is a tragedy. Here's a man who has been given so much. He had so much to offer the world, so much capacity to make a difference. But he decided to keep it all to himself. He was found faithless, you could say. And I don't think Jesus tells us this parable as a judgment. I think he shares it with us as a wake-up call. Because Jesus wants us to see clearly just how beautiful it is and what a privilege it is to be God's steward. In all that we have, in all that we are, in all that we hope to be, I pray that we too will be found faithful. And as you and I think about how we personally are called to be stewards who are found faithful, I want to ask Steve to come up and talk to us a little bit about how it is that Emmanuel, as a church, is found faithful. In Corinthians, Paul said, as ministers of Christ, we are called to be found faithful. But what does that even mean? Faithful at what? Found faithful by who? I think the second question is the easier of the two. We need to be found faithful by God. Only God can see into our hearts and our minds and observe our every act whether it's faithful or not. But the first question is much harder. How are we supposed to be faithful? I think the answer to that is to strive in all things to be like Jesus. Jesus's life was one of mission and ministry. He gave all that he had in furtherance of those two goals. He gave all that he had right up to giving his own life. How are we at Emmanuel rising to that challenge? I know that we do a lot of fundraising here at Emmanuel. We take special offerings. We have a wonderful M squared program, the funds of which are used in a number of missions and projects throughout the year. But a very important part of our striving to be like Jesus is accomplished through our mundane operating general fund. 
That's the fund that we are now in the middle of doing our stewardship campaign for and which will wrap up um, later on in uh, November. This general fund is the fund that allows us to do the ministries and mission for God in this place. It provides us with the monetary resources, among other things, to provide a pastor for us. A pretty good one at that. Staff for a smooth administration of all of our programming needs and for our music, our music staff, and our musicians and our leaders. It gives us a space to come together to worship and to provide ministry and mission, a topic that uh, Jerry Sabatis will discuss with us in another week. It also makes us a presence on the internet. It's through the general fund that we're able to have Steve at the back of the, of the sanctuary recording our services and sharing it throughout uh, to the many, many people who view it during the course of the week. All told, this accounts uh, in these many ways for approximately 50% of our budget. This fund also provides the resources to, for us to engage in mission that's not only part of our three, uh, 2M program, but it's part of a worldwide mission. 14% of our budget each year goes to shared ministries with the uh, annual conference. This, uh, these funds go in support of ministry and missions, not only in the Upper New York Conference, but the monies are shared around the world. It brings aid to refugees, to victims of war and natural disasters, and it is used for mission and education throughout the world. You often have seen me over the years, some of you longer members like Dick um, and Lucille, when I've been up here with my yellow pad speaking about Emmanuel Finance. And that's because Helen and I are firmly committed to Emmanuel and to all that we do and stand for here. We support this church family because we see every day that the good that is accomplished by this outstanding congregation of Christians. On November 19th will be our Pledge Commitment Sunday. I'm asking you to join with us in making your pledge at that time, and if at all possible, to consider an increase in your pledge over last year. The finance team is looking at the same inflationary uh, gap that every one of us is facing on an individual basis, and we have to work as hard as we can to close it. Um, so your pledge and any increase would be greatly appreciated. And so we ask that you join us on the 19th and you do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Steve. As Steve mentioned, you will be receiving a stewardship letter in the mail within the next week or so that will tell you a little bit more about the campaign. There will be an estimate of giving card in there. We're going to ask you to pray about that estimate of giving card and to consider returning it on the 19th of November for our Commitment Sunday when we will receive the commitments of this congregation to do ministry in 2024. Today we want to thank you for all of the gifts that you give each day, each week, that allow us to do the ministry that we do. We're going to hear some wonderful special music, and, uh, and uh, then we are going to bring our gifts to God and uh, offer those gifts at the altar. And so our uh, ushers are going to come forward, and we will pause now to receive this morning's offerings of gifts and tithes.
just another way in which we have been blessed at Emmanuel with the musical talents of our musicians. Let's stand and sing as we bring our gifts to God. We thank you, God, for the love that you show us and for the opportunity that you give us to show our love for you and the world in return. You have brought us by your grace to this day. Lord, we offer you now what is in these plates. It's just a portion of what you have given us. But we ask that you would bless it and accept it with the intentions of our hearts, our minds, and our souls. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to be seated as we sing together our prayer song, More Like You. Oh, Jesus, that is our prayer, that you would make us more like you each and every day, in each and every way. You told us that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart. For the times when our hearts have been focused on the vanities of this life, and we have loved you with less passion than we love the things of this world, we ask for your forgiveness. For when we failed to love our brothers and sisters, especially when we neglected the poor 
the stranger and the refugee. And for when we have treated others as less than ourselves, forgive us, O Lord. Today we pray not only for ourselves, but for those whose names and conditions have been raised in our hearts. We pray for the world and people around us. We pray for Anne's family, for Dan and Nancy, for Harriet and Helen and Steve and their family, for Sharon and Lisa, for Gray and Arnie, Bonnie and Betty, Patty and Marcia, Jeanette and Lori, Keith and Michelle. We pray for Tyreek and his platoon as they are deployed. And for the innocent people of Gaza, Jerusalem, and Maine who find themselves in the midst of tragedy and war. We pray for Dave and Mary Pat. And we pray for Dave as he prepares to retire. Lord, hear the prayers of your people. And in your love and in your great wisdom, answer our prayers. We thank you, holy and compassionate God, for hearing us, for answering us, for redeeming us. We thank you and we praise you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our brother and our friend, who taught us to pray to you as one family when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a few announcements to make you aware of for this week. Uh, tomorrow, the carpets are being cleaned out in the hallway area and the fireside room and uh, the office area. And so the office will be closed tomorrow. I understand that the knit and stitch group is going to meet, but they're going to meet upstairs. So you're going to come in through the door, the Casson Road doors, okay? Um, because this area will be uh, blocked off for cleaning. And the carpets will look beautiful on Tuesday when the office reopens in the morning. And then on Wednesday, the carpets here in the sanctuary are going to be clean. This is part of our trustees taking care of this beautiful facility that we have been given. And so uh, Wednesday morning, the uh, sanctuary carpets are going to be clean. That means when you leave today, if there's anything on the floor, could you pick it up and put it either on the pew or in the rack under the chair that you're seated in? That will help the folks doing the carpet cleaning when they get here on Wednesday morning to not have to take quite so long in prep and get those carpets cleaned quickly and efficiently. Next Sunday, we celebrate All Saints Sunday here. And uh, this is the week when we lift up the names of the saints who have gone home to be with Jesus in this past year from our church. And we will light candles here on the altar. Some of you have provided names already to the office. Those names will be included. But if you have somebody in your life, doesn't have to be the last year, who you consider to be a saint, who you miss, who is now home with Jesus in heaven, I want to invite you to bring a candle from home. And next Sunday, while we receive the Sacrament of Holy Communion, you'll bring that candle up here with you and light it and place it on the altar. And at the end of the communion service, we will have a beautiful altar adorned with candles as we remember the saints triumphant. That's next Sunday. Um, let's see. The other thing you're going to do next Sunday, you actually can do it Saturday night, is you're going to turn your clock back one hour. 
And when you do that, you say, thank you, Pastor Jack, for that extra hour of sleep. And if you don't do that, you'll get here nice and early for church next week. <laughs> you can get the coffee going. You can set things up for us. You'll probably be here alone. But, you know, make sure you turn your clock back Saturday night so you're on time next Sunday. Shelly, Betty, do we have a report from uh, this weekend's activities? Right. Yes, sir. Okay, Jerry's looking for some strong backs for tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock for a, a quick job of moving furniture for the third time uh, so that the carpet cleaners can get the hallways cleaned. Maybe you can stop in on the way to work, see Jerry afterwards, and talk to him outside and let him know that you'll be available. Betty, tell us about this weekend. You can do it right there. Just turn around, though, so that you get on the camera and everybody can see you. There you go. Good morning, everybody. Um, anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Betty Block. Um, Closer to the mic. Anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Betty Block. And Shelly and myself and Denise um, worked real hard on the craft show this year, as usual. But this was the best year of all. Um, I'll start with St. Joe's Pantry. We do a, um, a food drive during the craft show, and people bring in food. And we've got a grocery cart full of it. And if they don't bring a, don a donation of a non-perishable food item, they're um, welcome to give a gift, a monetary gift. So with that, we had gotten $236 from these donations. And Dorothy Poo, who is one of our crafters, always gives us 75% of what she makes. And she gave us a check for $100. So we had $336 that's um, going to St. Joe's plus the food in the cart. Um, the next thing, um, anybody who is here that um, helped at the uh, craft show or if they worked at it or came and shopped, would you raise your hand? Thank you so much. I don't know how to... Thank everyone for showing up and for um, shopping from our crafters. Um, the money that we make is really important to the church for missions. Um, we have been able to have um, affiliation with Sleep in Heavenly Peace and buying um, towards the beds, also the bedding. Um, right now we're in the middle of um, putting in a lift for someone, and all this money comes from missions. So when we have the fundraisers for them, it doesn't just go into one area, it goes into many. It helps to feed children, it helps with, um, down in um, Brown Memorial, down in the Camillus um, Church. But I wanna thank everyone for participating and helping out with all of these things. Um, Barb's Bistro, um, we had Barb's famous macaroni and cheese again, and everybody looks forward to that. Um, and up in the kitchen, Denise had taken um, charge along with her crew um, to be sure that we had food for everyone to eat. Um, and they had made $789.81 in the kitchen. So that was Awesome. Um, the sale of our tables. Our crafters pay $40 for a table space and bring in their items that they make. There are no vendors, it's all handcrafted items. And this year we made, in the table cost, $2,210. So our total for the um, craft show that goes to um, missions was $2,999.81. So thank you everybody for your help. $2,999.81.
Somebody in this room has 19 cents and needs to see Betty Block with 19 cents today. But there also are goodies left over out there from Barb's Bistro. So when you go out to get a cup of coffee this morning, you can take home some wonderful baked goods and that'll put us over. But, but somebody run up to her and hand her 19 cents, will you? So we can get there. All right, we're gonna sing our closing song this morning. And it uh, comes from the hymnal, The God of Abram Praise. We're gonna sing the first two verses. If you're able, will you stand and join us as we sing? Friends, go in peace to love and care for one another in Christ's name. And may God's love fill your hearts and your minds. May God's grace dwell in your souls and give strength to you. And may God's mercy move within you and give you a beautiful love for yourself and for your neighbors. Now and forevermore. Amen.